I'm Lisa Abramowitz. Welcome to Bloomberg Money Undercover, a show that provides valuable insights into alternative investments. We take you inside the world of private debt, equity, and real estate. Let's get straight to the burning issues in private markets. Survival of the fittest. Investment firms are racing to adapt in the face of lower yields. Then looking at the fallout from storied unicorns that end up being donkeys and catching up with the new masters of the universe, how a web of shadow bankers are steadily taking business from Wall Street. Let's get into some of these burning issues. With me now is Bloomberg's Shanali Vasek, Mark Millian, and Kelsey Butler. Shanali, let's start with WeWork. Uh, we are looking at two firms right now that are trying to offer and compete to offer rescue packages to this very troubled company. What does that say about the state of affairs? Well, uh, you, some would say that it is a little too big to fail, at least for the companies that are involved. SoftBank, for example, they've already had more than $10 billion put into this company. They already are are the biggest shareholders. So to put in more equity, what does that really do for them? Meanwhile, for JP Morgan, they have a lot of parts of the bank that are exposed to this firm. However, even to get them debt financing would mean going back to clients that are demanding a very high yield should they buy into this debt. I feel like I ask you this question every week, but do we have a clearer sense of whether WeWork is a very specific story or whether there are other too big to fail startups uh, that some big firms have their teeth in? This is pretty specific. It is pretty specific. That doesn't mean all the companies that have had inflated values are not seeing problems right now. Even Goldman Sachs, more than $200 million worth of write downs based on their Uber stake Aventor. And so these are volatile investments. People knew that when they were getting into them. The question is how much does any one firm take on? SoftBank is grappling with that question right now. So SoftBank and JP Morgan, both banks. But this brings me to Mark and how the fallout from these struggling unicorns is impacting the broader tech world because there's been a lot of cross investing. Uh, which tech companies, non-financial companies, have the biggest investments in unicorns uh, that are WeWork and Uber and Didi and perhaps the non-public companies uh, that are perhaps a little bit less visible? Yeah, well, as uh, Shanali mentioned, SoftBank has a lot on the line with, uh, with both Uber and WeWork. Um, another major uh, Uber investor is uh, Google's parent company, Alphabet. Um, and then in the case of G, uh, Didi, which is you know the Uber of China, uh, it's China's two most valuable tech companies, Alibaba and Tencent, as well as uh, Apple, the yeah. world's most valuable company. Well, but Mark, we talk about the big tech and having so much cash, and I'm just wondering, aside from these sort of high-profile names, how much cross-investment there is within the tech world, big tech giants going after smaller startups. Yeah, I mean, I think in those examples, you can you can see that there's there's quite a bit. Uh, as Shanali mentioned that SoftBank has you know ten, more than ten billion dollars on the line with WeWork. Uh, they they've got almost uh, ten billion in exposure to Uber. Um, Apple put a billion into Didi, and they've got a billion in SoftBank's tech fund. Um, but we're also talking about companies with just mass fortunes, and so. The the expo you know if if a couple of these companies go down it's not it's not going to take Apple with it but we're still talking billions and billions of dollars. That brings us to survival of the fittest. Big asset managers are taking some big steps to boost profits at a time of low yields. Kelsey Fidelity expanding right now into alternative credit. Why? So uh, Fidelity is stepping into uh, alternative credit as it sees pressure on fees uh, from other parts of its business, like mutual funds, brokerage trading. Um, this is really part of a bigger narrative of alternative credit really booming. Uh, according to one estimate, private debt could hit $1 trillion in 2020. That's nearly the size of the leverage loan and junk bond markets. Um, so we're really seeing investors be uh, much more uh, interested in private debt due to uh, decline yields elsewhere and uh, because of the complexity of it uh, firms like Fidelity are able to charge higher fees. Kelsey in a sort of related uh, note we saw that Blackstone was reportedly looking to buy a stake in Citadel not exactly necessarily alternative credit specifically but how much are we seeing alternative asset managers sort of taking stakes in one another to boost returns? Yeah, so this was a deal that didn't cross the finish line, but there have been other ones that uh, have come to fruition. Um, we've seen firms like Blackstone and Dial um, take stakes in other alternative asset managers, uh, including Blackstone in August uh, bought a stake in BC Partners, uh, Dial last year bought a stake in Golub. so definitely part of a broader trend. 
Thank you, Kelsey, and to all of our reporters. Nice that you mentioned Golub in bank uh, earnings this uh, week. We've got a tremendous amount of news, but a big question looms over all of Wall Street. How much competition are banks facing from the growing world of alternative asset managers, which are raising, as you mentioned, billions of dollars to lend to corporate America? Joining me now, Lawrence Golub, Chief Executive Officer of Golub Capital with more than $30 billion under management. Lawrence, thank you so much for being here. I want to start there, how much you're competing and increasingly find yourself coming up against some of the big banks out there. Banks are really good at real estate lending. They're very good at asset-based lending. They're really not very good and not staffed up to do enterprise value lending to established companies. And at this point, the evolution's gone on for about 12, 15 years. At this point, we hardly ever see banks as lenders competing with us in our market. Well, how much competition is there away from banks just with other alternative asset managers given how much cash has been raised? Plenty. There's abundant liquidity in all parts of the market all over the world. And you know, for us, we have to be an operating business. We have to be in the business of solving problems for our borrowers, not just providing money. If one's a desk buyer of assets that are created by somebody else, it's very hard to earn a steady good return at acceptable risk. All right, so if you're digging deep into some of these companies, given how much money is out there chasing after the chance to lend to them, are you seeing credit quality deteriorate in a meaningful way? Well, the quality of borrowers is really very good. and. In our segment, most of the companies are controlled by private equity firms, and that's great because private equity firms are smart owners. They know how to advance growth, they know how to recognize mistakes, they know how to change management. Having said that, when more money is chasing the same asset class, private equity firms are also very smart about extracting better terms. And uh, I think that terms today have been pretty steady with where they were over the past 18 months, but terms today are looser than they were five years ago, and that's significantly a consequence of money coming into the market. What's the potential consequence of that? Well, there, there are at least two, two consequences to that. One, it means that lenders have, in some cases in the broadly syndicated loan market, no financial maintenance covenant protections at all, which means that the borrower doesn't need to come and seek an amendment if it's underperforming. It can continue to operate till it runs out of cash. Hasn't been a problem for the, in a good economy. Default rates have not really gone up. The uh, second element of it is it allows, uh, it, it allows private equity firms to add different layers, play around with collateral bases, and for a less sophisticated investor or lender can get them into trouble. We were just putting up a chart showing uh, the middle market earnings growth and how it's actually been outperforming uh, the larger cap stocks. This is due to your third quarter report that you just put out. Can you walk us through what you've been seeing in terms of earnings growth strength there? Yes, absolutely. So we at Gallup Capital lend to about half the U.S. economy. We lend to businesses that have recurring revenues that generally are focused on U.S. customers. We've been publishing for years the Gallup Capital Middle Market Report, which provides actual results for the first two months of each calendar quarter of companies in our portfolio. Now, normally, these results, the profit growth rates, have been highly correlated with the S&P 500. This quarter, Massive, massive difference. The, uh, our, our index is showing third quarter growth in profit of 13%. Consensus for S&P 500 companies is down four, four and a half percent. So that's really screaming there, there's meaning here. Yes, yeah, so what's the meaning? Well, if you separate out three factors, one, the U.S. middle market companies have very little exposure to the weakness in European economies and Asian economies. Number two, the companies we lend to uh, tend not to ha be export driven and tend not to have exposure to internationally priced commodities. So the energy sector in the U.S. actually is not as strong as the rest of the economy. The farm sector is not as strong as the rest of the economy. But at the core, middle market companies, which account for more than half the job growth in the United States, are performing very, very well. Third factor is, you know, might indicate that earnings estimates are just a little too conservative right now. Lawrence Golub of Golub Capital, thank you so much thank for you. being with me. Coming up this week's power player, Scott Lawler, the founder and chief executive officer of Waypoint Real Estate Investments, give us a barometer of the U.S. real estate market. We're buying as well as selling. It's a fine time to sell, and I'm a big believer of chips off the table. But again, I'm also a big believer in the long-term big picture profile of the apartment market. I'm Lisa 
Abramowitz. This is Bloomberg Money Undercover. Now time for Power Player, our look at some of the most notable names in private markets. This week, let's drill into the market for apartment buildings. It's been a hot market since the crisis, but it's started to see cooling values in a number of major markets. Recently, I sat down with Scott Lawler, the chief executive officer and founder of Waypoint Real Estate Investments, which has billions of dollars tied to projects and properties in 24 states, and asked him about where the firm is buying. We've uh, done a lot of buying in the South, um, sort of from Florida to Texas, because we're a big fan of the demographic profile. Tremendous you know, population growth, job growth, and so on. And so we've been trying to take advantage of that. And it's with rentals. And one thing that you said in some recent data is that home ownership may not be the smart investment we once thought it was. Can you explain? So for about 70 years trailing before the financial crisis, the United States housing market only experienced one outcome every year, and that is the, ho the value of your house went up. And then that all turned severely, as we all know, and created the financial crisis. So my point is generations of Americans thought that the best thing you could ever do from a personal investment perspective was buy a house. And then all of a sudden that turned upside down um, violently and suddenly. It's not to say it's a bad investment today, but it is to say the assumption that it's automatically a good uh, investment is, has been, I think, uh, put to bed for life. Do you think, though, that going forward it is not a good investment for some individuals? I wouldn't tell someone it's a bad idea to buy a house. Um, the housing market very recently is experiencing a little bit of a, a shift in sentiment maybe, but it's been on a, a wonderful run for eight, nine, ten years now since the bottom of the crash. Um, but there are a lot of considerations about buying a house beyond just thinking about it from a financial investment perspective. So I, I, I think it's case by case. Big picture, I'm a fan uh, of the housing market because there are some things that the the for sale housing market tracks just like we do in the rental housing market, such as population growth, household formation, and so on. So I don't think that there's a crash in the housing market coming by any means. Okay, so one thing with the rental multifamily uh, properties, there's been a lot of interest in that space for years from Blackstone and some of the other uh, behemoth uh, investors out there. Do you think that values at this point have kind of peaked out and that it is time to sell some of these in your portfolio? Well, uh, we're definitely selling because it's a fine time to sell there's no other way to say it there's quite a bit of capital in the space but um, as far as whether values have peaked I think it's very difficult to say because as I said I don't know how to forecast the cycle I think the most important thing to do is take a long-term view and say I'm gonna buy this property in 2019 because I'm perfectly happy owning it till 2029 and what happens along the way we'll see do you think that in Boston in New York some of these markets uh, that there is more pain to be had in some of the property values yes um, so Boston New York maybe San Francisco some of the markets that are the highest profile that attract um, the sort of the highest price point product are where we're seeing the most softening. It's the markets that attracted the most institutional capital that led to the most new supply that have led to a little bit of a market correction is too strong a word but softening. So in other words if you have half a dozen towers coming out of the ground at the same time within a few blocks of each other say in San Francisco or Boston or something like that you know, that's where you might have a little bit of short term trouble but that's very very concentrated not only from a geographic perspective but from a price point perspective and is not at all indicative of the market broadly. How much more do you see the declines deepening from here in some of those regions? I don't think a tremendous amount more because we're not meaningfully overbuilt. I mean, the, the apartment market nationally is about 94, 95% occupied. And even in those markets that are experiencing some softening, um, we still have very strong occupancies. We don't have a tremendous amount of new pipeline coming. So I think that'll normalize. Even if there's a recession sooner rather than later, maybe that'll extend some of the pain, but nothing severe. So you said you were selling. Uh, are you using the cash to fill a mattress or are you actually buying some things as well? We're buying as well. So um, what we do frequently is when we sell a property, we offer our investors the ability to roll into the next property and uh, defer their capital gains. It's called a 1031 exchange. It's very popular. And so um, we're buying as well as selling. It's a fine time to sell. And I'm a big believer of chips off the table. But again, I'm also a big believer in the long term big picture profile of the apartment market. So I'm happy to take positions again, understanding that I'm not making a bet what the value is going to be in 2021. I'm making a bet that there were long-term drivers at my back that'll take me to 2029. So where are you buying? Well, um, our geography has expanded, so we've been um, investing still in our historic territory of, say, Florida to Texas quite a bit, um, but we've also expanded selectively uh, into the Midwest and into other property types. So we've been buying student housing properties and we've been buying uh, senior housing properties. What kind of income does your uh, portfolio of properties produce? We distribute uh, between about a six and a quarter and six and a half percent current return right now. 
around the portfolio, we typically start a little lower. We do a lot of work to improve the property, increase the rents, and then increase the current distribution. That was my conversation with Scott Lawler, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Waypoint. Sticking with housing, let's turn to college cash. Total educational debt could buy every U.S. house on the market almost twice over. This, according to Realtor.com. This makes it tough for younger families to even begin to think about buying a home, since on average, their student loans are about $8,500 greater than the typical down payment. But this may end up being a boon for places like uh, the South and the Midwest, such as Ohio, where those down payments are a lot more affordable. Well, sunny how Hawaii and California top the chart as the least favorable states by that measure. Coming up, Charles Schwab slamming the ta wealth tax as a destroyer of U.S. creativity. Next, we take a look at these type of tax plans that are being put forward by U.S. presidential candidates. This is Money Undercover on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Money Undercover. Time for our billionaire beat. Today, we're focusing on a potential 97.5% tax rate for America's wealthiest. Two U of C professors, University of California, that is, crunched the numbers and found that Bernie Sanders' presidency would mean that billionaires would be slapped with sky-high taxes. For more, we welcome Bloomberg corporate tax reporter Laura Davison in Washington. Laura, how could Bernie Sanders manage to get the tax rate up to 97.5% for billionaires? Yeah, so this is really the top 400 wealthiest Americans, so the, the richest of the rich billionaires. Uh, but basically what he does is he's taxing more than just income. He's taxing wealth. And so for wealth above uh, $10 billion, he's saying that he's saying annual, he's going to take 8% of that. So that's how you get that, that really high number. He's really looking with this plan to, to, uh, to lessen inequality. And, and this is uh, you know, what Elizabeth Warren has proposed, but even greater, even bigger. Wait, wait, Laura, so that means that Elizabeth Warren, who currently is the front runner of the Democratic Party, is proposing something very similar to what Bernie Sanders is doing? What she's doing, what Bernie is doing, but a little bit more moderate. Now, uh, Joe Biden would probably not say that this is a moderate plan, but but she was the the first one to come out in this field with a wealth tax. You know, it kicks in two percent on assets above fifty million, three percent once you get above one billion. There, uh, Bernie's uh, kicks in at a lower rate and has much higher rates. So he basically took her plan, modified it, and uh, and made it even bigger. So, Laura, can you just give us a sense of how the wealthiest individuals in America have fared under President Trump? Yeah, so in the back into the 2017 tax law, they saw um, their rates go down uh, pretty significantly. They were able, uh, you know, right now for the for the richest group, those those billionaires, they paid about 23% effective rate. Uh, that was a several po percentage point decrease from previous years, and um, that's both from lower rates as well as uh, being able to take advantage of uh, of different tax breaks and um, that were made available through the tax overhaul. So the tax plans being proposed by Elizabeth Warren uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders would that just bring us back to where we were or go significantly beyond the tax rates of the history uh, of history. That would be significantly beyond. Joe Biden would bring us back to about where we were. He'd raise a couple more things uh, for, for those richest uh, Americans, but with uh, he's about 30% of a tax rate on those people. Warren jumps to 62%, and Sanders is when you get to that 97.5%. So there's a big spread between where all the candidates are. Well, Charles Schwab, in, a, in an interview with Bloomberg, said, if you like socialism, we all drive the same car, have the same color house, or the same size house, blah, blah, blah. We're all the same fundamentally. He was talking about this wealth tax and how it essentially just killed creativity. Are you hearing more of that from other people? You know, there's a, there's a, a lot of disagreement uh, between economists and, and, and people who, you know, critics say, look, this is good. This just sort of, you know, make sure that, uh, that the wealthy pay their fair share. We're hearing that from Abigail Disney, from Warren Buffett. Uh, you know, but there are people who, like Charles Schwab, who are very much opposed to this. The thing here, though, is this is very far away from becoming a reality. There are, you know, huge political questions about if this could even pass, and then constitutional questions as well. It could uh, get killed in the courts. Bloomberg's Laura Davison, thank you so much. Speaking of wealth, more and more tech entrepreneurs are demanding prenups to guard against the chaos of divorce. Joining us with that story is Bloomberg's Ben Steverman. The interesting thing about this is it's they were looking for prenups before they even have their startup necessarily off the ground. Please explain. So uh, we talked to a lot of divorce attorneys, especially in the Bay Area, and millennials are going into these uh, offices and saying, I don't have any money, I barely have anything, but I have a few ideas and I want to protect them in case this marriage doesn't go well. 
So the prenup basically says that if the couple gets divorced, that whoever came up with the idea gets to keep any potential income tied to that. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. If this is your idea, this is your baby, and you want to put your energy into it, it doesn't matter what happens um, in, in, as the marriage goes on, this, you get to keep that. And it's important in California law and a lot of other states because any assets created during a marriage become community property, which could be split 50-50. So how does divorce complicate, for example, some of these startups? I mean, it seems to be a reflection of, of a complication that people are actually seeing happen. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, several major tech figures go through divorces and actually come through pretty much unscathed, but um, they can create a lot of havoc, especially if it's a private company that you're fighting over. And in Silicon Valley, these founders are very important, and it's very complicated when that founder might have to hand over some shares to someone else we're who showing, isn't even involved in the company. We're showing Jeff and Mackenzie. Be Bezos is probably right. the highest profile. Uh, prenups, how effective are they from staving off this type of chaos that you talk about? Well, judges do can and do throw them out all the time, and they're challenged all the time. Usually they are challenged if there's billions of dollars at stake. But um, the key is you really have to get them written well. You can't be, they can't be rush jobs. You really have to do this like months before the wedding. If, you, if you're springing a prenup on your, uh, your fiance the night before the wedding, it probably won't be held up. It probably also means that there might be other problems there might in be general, other though. In that way. Is, there, is there more acceptance, though, of the idea of a prenup now? Yeah, because people, one of the things that's happening is people are coming into marriage with more assets. They're older than they used to be. People are mar getting married much later. So it just becomes much more important. And people know that you know marriages don't last. And so as the more mature people get married, they, they're trying to protect themselves and their businesses. Perhaps not the most romantic, but <laughs> it is uh, very practical for many. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's Ben Steverman. And speaking of big money, it's time for this week's big number. This time, let's look at private equity fundraising for the third quarter. The number is $199.3 billion. That, according to Bloomberg data for worldwide closed funds, compares to about $203 billion for the third quarter of 2018. So still steadily raising cash to plow into companies. That does it for us. Reminder, you can watch us each Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong. From New York, this is Bloomberg.